Welcome to Ben Franklin's World, a podcast about early American history with Liz Covart. The study of history is key to understanding who we are and how we can affect a better future. Ben Franklin's World will introduce you to historical people and events that have impacted and shaped our present day world. And now, here's your host, Liz Covart. Hello, and welcome to episode 15 of Ben Franklin's World, the podcast dedicated to helping you learn more about how the people and events of our early American past have shaped the present day world we live in. Each week, we sit down with an historian to discuss their unique insights into our early American past so we can learn more about who we are and how we can affect a better future. In elementary school, many of us learn the verse, in 1492, Columbus sailed the ocean blue. But did you know that Columbus sailed the ocean blue because he was a participant in the great European quest to find new routes and shortcuts to the spice islands and markets of Asia? Today we speak with Joyce E. Chaplin, the James Duncan Phillips Professor of Early American History at Harvard University and author of Round About the Earth, Circumnavigation from Magellan to Orbit. Joyce will help us situate Columbus's discovery of North and South America in the context of the European quest to increase wealth via access to the spice and silk trades of East Asia. Joyce will help us discover how the Spanish and Portuguese desire to participate in the spice trade led to the European discovery of North and South America, who Ferdinand Magellan was and why we remember him as the first circumnavigator of the globe, and what effects contact between Europeans and non-European peoples had on populations and environments around the world. So without further ado, here's our conversation with Joyce E. Chaplin. With tidings and wisdom to share about our early American past, here is this week's special guest. Joyce E. Chaplin is the James Duncan Phillips Professor of Early American History at Harvard University. Her research interests include early American history, intellectual history, and topics where humans meet nature. Joyce has authored four books, including The First Scientific American, Benjamin Franklin and the Pursuit of Genius, and most recently, Round About the Earth, Circumnavigation from Magellan to Orbit. Welcome to Ben Franklin's World, Joyce. Hi, Liz. Thank you so much for having me on the program. I have to say I'm really excited about today's episode because I think it might set a record. Now, if you'll indulge me for a second here, the first circumnavigation of the globe took just under three years. Nearly 500 years later, the astronauts in the International Space Station go around the Earth every 92 minutes. But Joyce... You will take us around the world, or at least through the early history of around-the-world travel, in 30 to 40 minutes. <laughs> wow, I didn't realize we were going to be that quick. Okay, I'm ready to go. <laughs> but before we embark on our journey, would you tell us a bit about yourself and how you became interested in the history of circumnavigation? Ah, I started my project on the history of circumnavigation when I went to sea with a book. It's an old, old story. Um, I had been working on uh, the history of Benjamin Franklin, and part of my study, which was an intellectual biography of him with an emphasis on science, looked at his work on the Gulf Stream. And when I told people I was working on Franklin and the Gulf Stream, they tended to ask me, well, have you seen the Gulf Stream? And since I hadn't, I decided I wanted to go do that and joined part of a semester at sea program, the Sea Educational Association's cruise uh, going through the Gulf Stream. And uh, I uh, went aboard as a lecturer slash deckhand because I was going to be at sea for a long time and wanted to work on my French because I was working on Franklin's time in France. I took a novel in French, which turned out to be uh, Jules Verne, Around the World in 80 Days, which was just completely lucky at random. I picked this book, and from there got really interested in the history of Around the World travel that Verne was part of, and as I would discover later, Franklin was part of. And out of curiosity, what did you witness while you were in the Gulf Stream? Well, going through the Gulf Stream was very rocky, uh, and that's how I discovered that I didn't have sea legs 
uh, or not very strong sea legs. So that was my introduction to the worst seasickness I have ever experienced, but also um, gave me a really great sense of the, the, the drama of the Gulf Stream, that uh, it really is warm and fast as a current running through a cooler ocean on both sides. So you you really feel it and see it quite dramatically. So that was amazing. I was really glad I did that despite the seasickness. Wow. And I guess the seasickness, you know, you had no way of knowing, but would give you an idea of maybe what the circumnavigators you were going to study faced. A very small taste, right. I mean, I'd never been seasick on smaller ships. It really depended on the kind of the size of the ship and the motion. So, no, I had no idea. Uh, I got over it, which was fantastic and meant that my suffering was temporary, unlike, I think, what a lot of people experience going around the world, where it seemed like for those early ventures, the miseries really never stopped. So, before we get into the particulars of around the world travel. Could you tell us when man first developed the idea that he should circumnavigate the globe? And what did man know about the earth and its size when he set out to sail around the world? There was actually pretty good uh, geographic knowledge that the world was round. So that idea that people in the Middle Ages, for example, thought that the earth was flat and you could sail off the edge is a complete myth created in the 19th century to, in a sense, do down people in the Middle Ages to show that they were ignorant, uh, whereas actually they weren't, not at least about this. So from the ancient Greeks, uh, people in the Middle Ages had inherited the idea that there was a round globe and they lived on certain parts of it. And there would have also been, before the first circumnavigation, increasingly accurate estimates of how big the world was. Most of those estimates still tended to be on the small side, uh, and so even Christopher Columbus goes out with a sense that the world is smaller than it would actually turn out to be. Nevertheless, there is accumulating geographic information, knowledge of a physical globe represented through maps and globes that would have been to hand for European navigators as they might have decided to go around the world. One interesting part about this accumulating uh, knowledge about the globe was the theory of an international dateline, as we would now call it, or as it would eventually be called, the circumnavigator's paradox, meaning that at some point going around the world, you change the date on the calendar. Uh, There's no way to represent uh, a 24-hour day in terms of the sun's progress in relation to the Earth. If you yourself are going around the world, uh, you have to change the calendar date if you're going to make that adjustment. So theoretically, this is understood, though no one had actually experienced it. Wow, the first case of time travel. You don't just go around the world, you, you save a day. Exactly, or lose it, depending on which direction you're going to go. And uh, this would remain a characteristic part of going around the world, uh, the circumnavigator's paradox changing the date on the calendar. So yes, circumnavigation is the first proven and really the only proven method of time travel for humans. There we go. So what is it about the Iberian Peninsula? How did Spain and Portugal come to take the early lead in the quest to explore and sail around the world? It's always, in a sense, good historically to be the underdog. Uh, Spain and Portugal were very poor nations in the late Middle Ages and into the early modern period. The wealthy nations that controlled international trade, uh, and especially the most lucrative international trade, were the Italian-speaking lands. And it was Italians who really controlled most of the trade going into Asia with all of the incredibly uh, costly goods, spices, and fabrics, uh, especially, that came out of Asia, having to go through a kind of Italian market uh, in order to reach European consumers. So Italians were quite wealthy because they controlled this trade. Nations like Spain and Portugal that faced the Atlantic had no such commercial opportunities. That meant that the Spanish and Portuguese had to be more inventive, and this is why a lot of the lead in terms of what we now think of as global exploration was taken by Spanish and Portuguese mariners who had to take the longer and harder or more unlikely routes to try to get to Asia. So uh, Christopher Columbus sailing across the Atlantic in order to try to reach Asia. Vasco da Gama going around the entire continent of Africa in order to reach India. 
through a sea route, so he wouldn't run into the Italians who controlled the land route. So let's look at the first instance of circumnavigation. In 1522, Spain became the first country to circumnavigate the earth. And in an ironic twist, they did so largely under the direction of a Portuguese captain. Would you provide us with a brief overview of Ferdinand Magellan's story and how history remembers him as the first circumnavigator of the earth when, in fact, he died during his voyage? (laughs) That's right. Poor Ferdinand Magellan is the most famous man who never went around the world. And I shouldn't express any sympathy for him necessarily. Uh, He was a Portuguese soldier, really involved pretty heavily with uh, Portuguese attempts to fight their way into India, especially, and other parts of Asia where they were going to, by conquest, take over trading routes and uh, commercial opportunities that the Italians had not themselves claimed. Uh, At some point, Magellan feels stymied in terms of his commercial and personal opportunities, and he decides to try to convince the monarch, the king of Portugal, to back him in an attempt to sail into Asia going around the Americas. He takes that proposal to the king of Portugal and is turned down, and he decides at that point that he'll go to the king of Spain, uh, the monarchs of Spain, and uh, run the same prospectus by them and get backing in order to, again, circumvent both the Portuguese and Italians and any other Europeans at this point in the routes to Asia going eastward, and instead he's going to approach it westward. The knowledge of the Americas in terms of how much landmass there was and whether there was a sea route that would lead toward Asia was fairly hypothetical. Uh, Magellan was taking a big chance in terms of presenting this possibility to anyone. Uh, Nevertheless, uh, he works with one cartographer um, and uh, makes a, a, a case that is convincing enough to Spain that he is allowed to outfit a fleet. And Magellan works with a cartographer and other maritime experts, uses his own knowledge to put together this proposal that convinces the Spanish authorities, and he's allowed to assemble a fleet with sailors, all the experts he might want, trade goods, and to sail around the Americas and into into Asia. What was life like aboard Magellan's ship? How did these explorers live, work, eat, and sleep? How often did they make it to shore? And I'm really curious, how did they deal with the uncertainty of how much water and what lands lay ahead of them? In the early modern period, it was common for sailors to refer to a ship as a wooden world, and that's really expressive of how they felt like that was their home. That was the world that they had to live in as they went wherever they were going. For long-distance sailing ventures, for, for, for cruises, the wooden world was especially important because you had to pack it with all the expertise, all the supplies, food, water, metal, wood, everything extra, and then enough of the specialized instruments to keep the ship on course. You had to pack all that. You couldn't expect necessarily to get anything along the way. So when Magellan sets out with five ships, and we think around 280, 290 men. We don't have an accurate count. But when he sets out, he has to be really well prepared. Making land was something that could be done in parts of the world you knew well, you kind of knew, uh, about how long it would take within normal circumstances to get from one place to another. Of course, Magellan was setting out into parts of the world where that geographic knowledge was completely absent. So this was a gamble. How much do you need to take? Uh, If you take more people, which are necessary, you need more food. Where is the right ratio uh, between experts and working men that you need and the amount of food that you can actually pack? So especially when Magellan uh, goes through the strait that now bears his name through the tip of South America and enters the Pacific Ocean, as it would later be called, uh, it was completely unclear where they would make land next. And indeed, the fleet has incredibly bad luck that they don't make land across the entire Pacific until we think they fetched up on Guam. That was a long, long way to go. And it's clear 
that not only is the crew desperately physically suffering by the time they do finally make land, but sentiment has really kind of turned against Magellan. That's a long, depressing journey uh, to undertake. It's clear that a lot of the men were suffering from scurvy by the time they make any land, and they never really completely recover. So Joyce, how did Magellan do in his packing ratio? Did he pack enough food and pack enough experts? Well, I don't, I don't think there would have been in any way for him to calculate. And, you know, he's completely lucky that they do find Guam. It could have been much worse, in fact. It might have been better. They might have accidentally tripped over Tahiti, but there was just no telling. And it, odds were that not all the men and not all the ships were, in fact, going to make it back. Uh, in effect, the journey is successful because one ship and 35 of the men do finally make it back. But clearly, starting with five ships and close to 300 men means that they were just beaten down again and again and again. So the voyage across the Pacific was clearly very bad, but a circumnavigation is a marathon. It's all kind of wearing. Uh, It's a war of attrition, both against the planet, the size of it, uh, the very uneven distribution of land and its resources for human beings. So especially when there isn't very good geographic knowledge about how to cross the Pacific or other oceans, the attrition is going to be that much worse. And the attrition was something I found very striking in your book. Joyce states that Magellan's crew suffered a mortality rate of 86%. Joyce, why was the death rate so high? Was it the scurvy? Was it the lack of food? What dangers did these early circumnavigators face? Well, pretty much everything. Again, the war of attrition and the way in which the the planet, the size of the planet, is just a force to be reckoned with, I think that's the big background reason. On the other hand, because Magellan's expedition was a military venture, the possibility or the likelihood of conflict with other human beings on land, the attrition that the attempted invasions was going to exert even on the invaders was a consequence of this military preparation. And it's for that reason that Magellan himself loses his life in an attempt to claim land in the Philippines where the locals were having none of that. And uh, Magellan's force is repulsed and he himself is killed. Now, there are a lot of things that led to these sailors' death. But if we could just focus on scurvy for a minute, it seemed like that was like the number one killer of circumnavigators. Could you talk about whether it was and what scurvy was and how people contracted it? We now know that scurvy is a condition that results from not having enough vitamin C in the body, uh, and the body really deteriorates. It just kind of falls apart. People in the 16th, 17th, 18th, and 19th centuries did not understand scurvy in that way. Very, very interestingly, sailors called it earth sickness, not in the way that sea sickness is the, the sea makes you ill, but instead more in the sense of homesickness, uh, that you miss something so badly you feel ill. The assumption for circumnavigators and other mariners was that human beings were healthy on land. They were terrestrial creatures. If they went to sea for long periods of time, it made sense that their health would not be as good. So scurvy was seen as earth sickness, the most obvious example of how the human body, when taken away from land, longs for that land, is desperate to get back to it. And so circumnavigators describe how even being on land, smelling the air, revives people. And I find it amazing that sometimes when uh, ships had scurvy patients, but they can't make land for very long, they try to really soak in its qualities as quickly as possible. So they'll take those scurvy patients and they'll bury them in the earth as if the earth itself is going to restore them. It's a kind of tonic. In the absence of uh, exposure to land, the circumnavigators tried to pack ships with as many terrestrial things as possible, especially food and especially fresh food, sometimes fresh water taken from land, with an idea that if you got water from a spring, for instance, that was better than distilling seawater and making fresh water out of it. 
the circumnavigators were even interested in trying to get water from land rather than drinking anything distilled from seawater with the assumption that water from land had restorative properties that distilled seawater could never actually give you. And did turning the bo- you know their ships into mini Earths, did that help drop the death rate? Because another striking detail of your book is so 240, 250 years later, by the time Englishmen John Byron and James Cook sail in 1765 and 1768 respectively, the mortality rate drops considerably. Byron experienced a mortality rate of 3.9%, Cook 3.5%. And by the time Cook sails again in 72 to 75, he experienced near a 0% mortality rate. So why did the death rate drop so considerably? Is it because they have all of these, you know, better water supply or they try to make landfall? I'm sure it helps that they actually did have enough food and water. Now, it didn't necessarily mean that they were packing food that we would think would be rich in vitamin C. But the thing about scurvy is it's one of those conditions where once you have it or if you're teetering on the edge, any other kind of stress is going to make it worse. So I think what happens with those 18th century expeditions where the death rates are really astonishingly low compared to what had happened earlier, very impressive, what happens is captains are just taking care of their crews better more generally. This tracks an 18th century shift in terms of the emergence of human rights, the idea that even uh, sailors, even lower class working men are deserving of respect and good treatment. And some of that translated into, yes, bring enough food for them, make sure they have water. There was also a modification of the work regime aboard ships, where Cook was especially very concerned that the men work in um, shifts, they stand watches, according to a more merciful schedule, where they are actually getting more sleep. So that would help, too. Again, if you're teetering on the edge of scurvy, you don't want stress. You want to be rested. You want adequate amounts of food. Even if they're not very rich in vitamin C, that's going to help everything. Circumnavigation also had global consequences. Could you speak to how contact between European peoples and the peoples and environments around the globe, what impact that had on those places. And in in reverse, what how did contact with foreign peoples and places affect and change European environments and populations? It's really clear that circumnavigations were imperial ventures. These are ways in which Europeans wanted to get to parts of the world that they wanted to control directly through invasion or they wanted to have some kind of commercial monopoly within. So these are not innocent ventures. They're not voyages of exploration simply for the sake of knowledge. They really are an imperial desire for command over different parts of the globe. Along the way, it also becomes clear that Europeans think that they're the ones who command the entire globe because they can go around it. So a circumnavigation becomes this big gesture, not only of imperial control over distant people, different places, but over the entire earth. I think this is a damaging fantasy for many reasons. Uh, The whole imperial idea of invading other parts of the world, we now deplore, and quite rightly, uh, that was a very bad part of Western history that we're still trying to undo the damage from uh, in different parts of the world. The fantasy of having command over the entire Earth, of human beings, each of us very, very tiny in relation to the planet, nevertheless being able to go around it, that has long-term consequences that I think we we still haven't really examined about how we think of ourselves as having command over nature. We're beginning to realize this is probably not a good thing to have done, but it really isn't necessarily challenged as directly as the legacy of imperialism is now. And I think it probably does need to be challenged at least as directly. As well, circumnavigations were definitely part of a global reshuffling of biota, plants and animals, and diseases included, uh, that are being moved around the world because of imperialism. We know part of this in terms of the Columbian exchange, the transfer of plants and animals and diseases across the Atlantic both ways, from the Americas into Europe, and then from Europe into other parts of the world, and then from Europe into the Americas. So there's a trade European 
domesticated livestock and wheat going into the Americas, American corn uh, and turkeys going into Europe and then beyond as well. There would be transfer of diseases, so smallpox probably most dramatically going into the new world. When circumnavigators are making their big passes around the planet, they're involved uh, with transferring things and also benefiting from the transfer of these things. So it's very dramatic. Uh, Francis Drake goes uh, around the world not that long after Magellan. Uh, at the end of the 1500s, uh, he goes around the world. By that point, parts of South America have been so colonized by the Spanish that by that time, parts of the Americas have been so colonized by the Spanish that Drake can expect that he can go into parts of South America and raid in order to get supplies. Uh, he can loot Spanish towns for whatever wealth they have, but also for bread. <laughs> um, he can even go into parts of South America where... European livestock have gone wild. There are wild horses. There are other kinds of animals where Europeans can recognize that these are sources of food or labor or whatever, and they can just take them. So circumnavigators not only are depositing European plants and animals around the world, but also benefiting from it as they can go into landscapes that have now been transformed and made more useful for them. Why did Drake feel the need that he had to plunder? Why couldn't he just stop at these places and ask for assistance? Well, here we go back to the question of imperial rivalry, that Spain and England were enemies for the period of time, most of the period of time uh, that Drake was alive. And he knew he could not expect assistance from them. They would have imprisoned him if he had uh, turned up unarmed. And he takes the opportunity, given the antagonism between his nation and Spain, to take whatever wealth they had. The Spanish were engaged in silver mining in South America, in the Andes, and were notorious for having this great amount of mineral wealth that they extracted from the Americas and sent back across the Atlantic. So it was very, very tempting for Drake to think of his enemies as being sources of wealth. Uh, and he takes from ships and from land, again, things that will make him wealthy and his crew, but also anything useful. So he really does take anything that uh, could possibly be useful along the way. Uh, he takes wood from ships. He takes prisoners who have any kind of geographic knowledge that might help him. So he really loots his way around the world. He is systematically extracting things and knowledge from the Spanish that can get him on the next leg of the journey. So imperialism, there's a very much an, an antagonistic relationship between countries. It's like my land, not your land, stay off of it. Does the world ever develop a more cooperative stance? Like, sure, you're circumnavigating the globe, stop in my port, we can help you out with oranges and water, or is that just too idealistic? I think the world moves toward that, but through two phases. The first phase is when European nations agree to respect each other's empires. This is particularly striking after the end of the Napoleonic Wars with the Congress of Vienna in 1815, this sets up what we might recognize as the beginning of a free port system, where in times of peace, if you are on a sailing vessel and need to make land, and you go into a port of a, a nation that is not at war with your nation at any point, then things are going to be good. You can buy what you want. If you're desperate, you could even be given assistance uh, so that uh, there would be a diplomatic network that would establish ways to help uh, ships and sailors who were uh, driven uh, on land without any resources. That's a system, however, this, this uh, network among nations uh, after 1815 that is really only among Western European nations. That is a system, the network of diplomatic relations after 1815, that really exists, however, only among Western nations. European states, the United States, and so on, with their colonial dependencies also involved um, in this, this nice world. It's harder, though, for what we would now call the developing world to benefit from this. Uh, and usually the benefits were only if parts of what we would call the developing world were colonies. <laughs> 
um, of these European powers. It becomes very important in order to achieve the third stage of really more global and universal peace among nations uh, and therefore free movement of travelers around the globe. That really relies on a, a system of alliances and a network that includes not only the West, but all the rest of the world. That's a 20th century story and very, very different from what existed for the history of circumnavigation in its first centuries. So Joyce, another thing I found striking in this tale of around the world travel is for the first several hundred years, it seems to be largely a male tale. Did any women undertake an around the world voyage? And if so, when did they start to make them? Well, there were probably always women aboard ships that went around the world for parts of the venture. Uh, so we know that there were female captives uh, who were taken uh, on the uh, circumnavigation that went first. After Magellan died, one of the commanders of the fleet does kidnap some women. The first woman, however, that we know went entirely around the world on one of these expeditions had to do it as a stowaway dressed as a man. Uh, this is the amazing Jean Beret, who went out with Bougainville uh, as the assistant and servant of the expedition's naturalist. <laughs> so they managed to disguise her. Uh, this is in the 1760s, and uh, she goes under until they make it to Tahiti, where the Tahitians identify her as female. And at that point, uh, it becomes clear that she is female and has joined a circumnavigation. In a sense, really challenging. I, I think you're, you're right. This was a boys' club, and uh, the maritime worlds of the early modern period were quite definitely very masculine. And it was a point of pride among a lot of nations to do a circumnavigation. That was a manly act indeed. So there was a lot of consternation that Jean Beret was going to join uh, the ranks of circumnavigators. There was such a sense uh, that going around the world was a male activity that, in fact, the first female to go around the world was not human. She was a goat. I should have mentioned her first. Uh, she went around the world with Samuel Wallace in the 1760s as a milk goat assigned to the expedition by the Admiralty. And then, poor thing, she goes out again with Cook. So she is not only the first female to go around the world, but the first female to go around the world twice. After she makes it back with Cook, she's retired um, and becomes a rather famous goat, uh, but she is the first female to undertake this act. After Jean Beret, the first woman, female human to go around the world, there's a fairly long gap. And the next woman that we know who goes around the world entirely in one circuit is in the 1820s, another French woman who goes out with her husband, a captain, and in a sense is not approved of. She has to sneak aboard initially in male clothing. And interestingly, all the official accounts of the expedition and even some of the illustrations erase her because it would not have been acceptable for the officer, uh, the captain, her husband, to have done this. So it was all kind of not uh, officially approved. And this sense that women don't go around the world, I think, is still there, uh, frankly. And it's always big news when a woman or increasingly a, a young woman or girl goes around the world because it just still seems kind of incongruous uh, that a woman would make this big global act. Wow. But at least I guess the world is, is changing. We can't change history, but we can hopefully affect a better future with this knowledge. Well, here's the thing. If there's a sense that going around the world is an imperial action, uh, ha, me against the planet and I win, I'm not necessarily sure that we should all get in on it. Defined that way, yes, it is important in terms of feminism that women uh, acquire uh, activities and accomplishments that have only belonged to men. On the other hand, this sense that we command the natural world and circumnavigation is a demonstration uh, of that imperial command over nature, I'm not, I'm not sure anyone should be doing that anymore, men or women. Well, that gives us a lot of food for thought. 
And we just have a few minutes left, which means it is time for the Time Warp. This is a fun segment of the show where we ask you a hypothetical history question about what might have happened if something had occurred differently or if someone had acted differently. Are you ready for the Time Warp, Joyce? Okay, I think so. The Time Warp. Historians can't predict the future, but they can speculate about what might have been. Just a little background before I get to my question. As a youth, Benjamin Franklin had expressed a desire to become a sailor. His father denied his request because Franklin's older brother Josiah had gone out to sea and never returned. So, Joyce, as you are an expert on both the history of circumnavigations and Benjamin Franklin, I'm curious. In your opinion, what might have happened if Franklin's father had let him become a sailor? Do you think he would have survived the perils of scurvy or circumnavigated the globe? And do you think he still would have made the significant diplomatic contributions and scientific achievements we remember him for today? I think I'm on Franklin's father's side on this question, (laughs) partly because I know that every time Franklin went to sea as a passenger, I mean, he crossed the Atlantic many times, Uh, every time he does that, he just about dies. His health is ruined. Uh, He does have good sea legs. I admire him that. He doesn't get seasick. Uh, But he has very weak lungs, and they always suffer when he's at sea for long periods of time. The second time he crosses the Atlantic as a young man coming back from London, he's on a ship where they are delayed and delayed and delayed and the food is running out. Uh, So I think he gets his first real taste of everything that could go wrong. Um, And he arrives in Philadelphia very, very weakened, very ill, and slightly later almost dies. So I think... Franklin's father was quite wise to say, not a good career move for you, stay at home, become a printer, because that is how Franklin becomes known to us and the world, acquires his influence, uses his interest and expertise in science uh, to define electricity in ways that still is valid for us today. So I think his going to sea would have been a disastrous idea, and had he gone on a circumnavigation, he might have been one of those early mortality statistics. Well, kudos to Benjamin Franklin's dad for keeping him on land. Before we conclude, would you tell us about your current research project? I'm working now on Thomas Robert Malthus, uh, for whom Malthusianism was named. Uh, Malthus was an 18th, early 19th century clergyman whose principle of population stated that human population always existed within natural constraints. I came to this because Malthus was very influenced by Franklin. Franklin's observations concerning the increase of mankind written in 1751 was the basis for Malthus's general idea. I'm writing a book with a colleague, Alison Bashford, called The New Worlds of Thomas Robert Malthus, that emphasizes how the Americas first, and especially as defined by Franklin, and then the new worlds of the Pacific, Australia, New Zealand, Tahiti, and so on, these new worlds were really at the center of how Malthus understands population existing within. The book that I'm writing with a colleague, Alison Bashford, is called The New Worlds of Thomas Robert Malthus, And our argument is that it is new worlds, starting with the Americas, as defined by Benjamin Franklin and others, and then continuing into the new worlds of the Pacific, Australia, New Zealand, Tahiti. These are at the center of Malthus's population analysis, because he says only in these places where you have indigenous populations and then settler populations moving in and competing for land, Only there do you really see the principle of population at its starkest. This has been something that studies of Malthus haven't emphasized. Most of the analysis of Malthus has stressed how people understood him in terms of European populations. But the New World populations and the imperial context for understanding population theory by the late 18th, early 19th centuries really matter, especially, I think, we still have new world fantasies, right? Uh, there's always going to be some place fresh with new resources. Uh, like the moon, Mars. asteroids, Mars, definitely. We're all headed toward Mars. 
And I think Malthus is very good for questioning this fantasy that however big our population gets, we'll just find new resources somewhere else. I think he was very cautionary in saying, yes, but they'll only last for so long, and why don't we think more rationally in the meantime? So that's what the book is about. It's a bit grimmer, I must say, than working on Benjamin Franklin, uh, who's always a little bit more cheerful and witty. uh, But Malthus really matters, and I think now more than ever. Great. And where is the best place to look for more information about you, your work, and how to get in contact with you? The best place to get information about me would be the website uh, that I have at Harvard. And I believe you can supply listeners with the URL. I will. I will include that in the show notes page for this episode. So Joyce, thank you so much for leading our circumnavigation of early around the world voyages. It's been a pleasurable experience, and I don't think anybody caught an an instance of seasickness. Or scurvy, thank heavens. So ahoy, and many thanks, Liz. Europeans, especially those who lived in poor 15th and 16th century Spain and Portugal, hungered to make it rich in the spice trade. Their desire to increase their wealth makes the story of early circumnavigations one steeped in greed, lust, and imperialism. As Joyce pointed out, that does not always make for a happy story. Many circumnavigators and the peoples they came into contact with died as a result of the European quest to find quick and easy routes to the spice islands and territories of Asia. But, For better or worse, it is the story of how Europeans came into contact with North and South America, which is why I wanted to have Joyce come on the show and talk about it. You can find more information about Joyce, her book, Round About the Earth, plus everything we talked about today on the show notes page for this episode. You'll find it all at benfranklinsworld.com slash 015. If you enjoy Ben Franklin's World, you may also enjoy the Junto Cast, a monthly podcast dedicated to exploring issues in early American history. The Junto Cast is hosted in a roundtable format by Ken Owen, Michael Haddam, and Roy Rogers, historians and bloggers at the Junto, a group blog on early American history. You can find more information about the Junto Cast and the Junto blog by visiting earlyamericanists.com. I would greatly appreciate it if you would rate and review this podcast. Your ratings and reviews have helped keep Ben Franklin's World visible and findable for new people. To rate and review Ben Franklin's World, a podcast about early American history, just visit benfranklinsworld.com slash iTunes or benfranklinsworld.com slash Stitcher. If you were unsure about how to leave a rating and review, no worries. Please check out benfranklinsworld.com slash reviews for helpful step-by-step instructions. And finally, how would you prefer to circumnavigate the Earth? Wooden sailing ship, 19th century steamer, modern cruise ship, or space orbiter? Please share your answers with me on Twitter, at Liz Covart, or via email, liz at benfranklinsworld.com. And remember, never leave till tomorrow that which you can do today.